But then they sent me to Taft, California, which is a really tranquil prison. I could calm down more. And I read the Book of Mormon four times. Mm -hmm. um, and the Gadians and Robbers and the Secret Combinations really, really pulled me in. Because that's what I came from. Right. Yeah. Hey guys, welcome back to Saints Unscripted. My name is Cam. Uh, I am happy to have as my guests Denise and Derek. Um, Derek was part of the Galanis crime family. Yes, sir. That's. I don't think that that's that's a first on Saints Unscripted. Um, and went to prison for a couple of years and has a pretty cool conversion story while he was there. Uh, and we're excited to hear from him. So I've I've done a brief. Look over of your background, but not too much. Um, could you share a little bit of your story? And sure, uh, my father was the Bernie Madoff of the nineteen eighties. Uh, when he was sentenced by Rudy Giuliani, he got twenty seven years, and it was the longest sentence for a white collar criminal ever. Um, so I grew up in that paradigm, which is you know a paradigm of greed, a paradigm of you know what is good for me, what do I want, um, and that was my entire life. Now. Also, I grew up in a paradigm of family's most important. I don't have friends. I got family. Now, ironically, my family was criminal, right? So it's a, it's a difficult um, way to split it, right? Where does your loyalty lie? What do you do? Are crimes just what we do? So my life was very confused until, you know, I found the scriptures for sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, tell me a little bit about the just... We don't have to get into too much detail, but the, the crimes that your family was involved in. Um. Sure. Yeah, we're mostly white collar crimes. I mean, they label us Gambino Associates. Okay. Um, and the Gambino crime family, as well as other crime families, is getting more into white collar crime. Okay. A lot more money for a lot less time in prison. Mm -hmm. You know, the murders and the drugs, they don't really do as much anymore. Um, I would say my father's biggest crime is robbing investment advisors. Um, if you think about an investment advisor, and I don't know how far in detail you want me to get. Well, you mentioned Bertie Madoff, so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm picturing like pump and dump, kind of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, ripping people's investments off and, and mm -hmm. profiting for yourself. So, yeah. yeah, well, pump, pump and dumps are the, like the lowest level, right? Okay. Um, people do that that don't have the sophistication to go further. Not to say I wasn't involved in many pump and dumps. Right. I was because there's times where you don't have a scam going that's more high end. And you do a pump and dump to sustain yourself. Mm -hmm. My brother did it till the day he went to prison again. He's still there right now. Um, he had a pump and dump called Code Rebel. But to be honest, they didn't even prosecute it because his other crimes were uh, so much so more much egregious. Weird, right. Yeah, that they already had him for like 15, right. 20 years as it is. Okay. So yeah, pump and dumps and robbing investment advisors, which is kind of what Bernie did. Mm -hmm. Bernie set up his own investment advisor. And he took the money in, and he just never paid anybody. Ran with it, yeah. yeah. Now, what I would say my father does is he likes to buy investment advisors or con them and get the money out of it. Mm. But at the end of the day, it's the same thing. Okay. It's, it's robbing money. And uh, when and how were you eventually caught? So uh, the first time I went to prison, I was in my 20s. I had been in Kosovo for two and a half years working on an insurance scam we had there. Um, it was very lucrative. I loved Eastern Europe. I was young and... You can pretty much guess untamed because I was a kid and the, the, the way I grew up. Um, I came back and I, I caught a drug case that I was involved with with one of my father's associates from prison. He was like my uncle. He came out. Um, to me, that's what my uncle was in those days. Um, and criminal figures hanging around the house was obviously not something strange. So I, I caught a drug conviction for an ecstasy lab. And I did about eight years on that okay. case. Yeah. And uh, had you two met? at this point? Well, so I'm going to let Denise okay, tell that. So the way that my husband and I are connected is I was um, 18 years old when I went to New York to be a nanny to his two younger brothers. Okay. So Derek and I have known each other almost his entire life. And we reconnected when he got out of prison the first time. And then we reconnected kind of at a deeper level when he was indicted the second time, which was in 2016 when he went back to prison. So, and yeah. what was what? Tell me about your experience in prison. Uh, what was that like? Uh, what happened while you were there? Well, I can't be honest with you. I mean, when you grow up in a family like mine, where everybody's self-interested and everybody's 
if not violent, very aggressive. Um, prison wasn't anything strange for me. I'm also a professional fighter, so you add those two together, and, and it makes it easier for me, because I don't have to deal with a lot of things maybe other people right. do. So, And to be honest with you, and I always told Denise this, prison was like always a great break from my family. Because of the drama and the stress, it was our... F- Thank, thank goodness I don't have to deal with that anymore. You're trying to get back in. <laughs> That's what it felt like at the end. Home. You know, my father spoke to me on the phone, and he didn't know that I had gone in and spoke to the authorities, but uh, he said, you know, Deeks, I talked to our prison consultant. We can all be in the same prison. And I didn't even answer because I thought to myself, not this. I don't want that. Yeah, this is the worst. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, and at some point along the way, you went through a little bit of a conversion process. Well, tell me about that. Yeah, so when I was in prison, I've always uh, tried to self-actualize when you're there because all the distractions are gone. And I learned Spanish. And and Denise said, uh, you know, yeah. honey, why don't you learn, why don't you learn something about God? And at the time, I said, you know what, I'll just read the Bible in Spanish because at least if I don't get anything and from the God angle, I'll perfect my Spanish. Um, and then I, I read that. And then Denise gave me the Book of Mormon. Uh, where I was at the time, I was in Latuna, Texas. This is a really harsh prison, and it didn't take. I didn't have time. But then they sent me to Taft, California, which is a really tranquil prison. I could calm down more, and I read the Book of Mormon four times. Mm. Um, and the Gadians and Robbers and the Secret Combinations really, really pulled me in because that's what I came that was from. Your life. Yeah. yeah, and I said, "Wow, this is actually." And I would talk to other inmates who were LDS, and they would say things like. It's a book for the new generations. It's a book for our modern times. And I realized that, I mean, Cain and Abel were a, a secret combination, if you will, too, but it doesn't outlay it the way the Book of Mormon does. And it really touched me and drew me in, and that's why I read it four times. So, yeah. And can I just interject something here? I think that once he became um, immersed in the scriptures, Derek is a very deep thinker. And... Um, he many most of our emails back and forth to each other during the next four years of his incarceration were centered around him learning about Christ and asking deep questions and um you know and the one phone call we got a week um it was always and having grown up in the gospel myself he uh, he would ask such thought provoking questions that sometimes I say. I need to find the answer to that. So he is a deep thinker. And so for the next four years, I would say the majority of our conversations were centered around him learning about Christ. And I think at some point we knew that I had, like, I thought in the beginning our relationship was to help him write his book. Because when he was first incarcerated, he wrote a book about his family. And then it became clear to me that Heavenly Father had a different plan for us and that we were supposed to be in one another's lives. And I've never married, and I've never married or had a family, and um, I was in my 50s, and um, both Derek and I had that same experience that we knew we were supposed to be together. And so we knew that when he was released that we would be getting married. So. Wow. Yeah. So you were raised in the gospel. I was. Okay. I was inactive for a period of time after I left his family. Um, Being with his family changed the course of my life. I struggled with addictions and um, other things for a number of years. And then because I came, you know, he was born into that family. And he didn't have a way out in the same way that I did. I was born into a loving, nurturing family. And they helped me through those difficult years. And... I put my life in order, and I did go on a mission when I was 30 and um, have remained active in the gospel since that time. And um, I always knew that if anybody had the courage to leave his family paradigm, I knew they would be forced into that life of crime. But I always felt when I left the family when I was in my, my 20s that it would be Derek. And 40 years later, it was Derek, who has left the family paradigm and has sought for something more, and he reached for the Savior, and he has never let go since that time. And Derek, when he was released, um, he had to do the remainder of his sentence on home confinement, Mm -hmm. and the federal agents came to my home to clear um, my home 
for um, his release. And I remember his parole officer, who is parole officer now, but at the time he was a federal agent, he was sitting there reading the rap sheet to me about Derek. And he says, you have no idea what you're getting into. And I said, I know who he is. The way you see him is how the world sees him. But I see him how our Father in Heaven sees him. And I know his worth and his value. And he he did the remainder of his sentence on home confinement, and we were married in our home. Um, why he finished his sentence by our bishop, and and he was he, you can tell the rest of the story taking the missionary discussions. Yeah, like, that was that was my next yeah. question. You you read the Book of Mormon while you're in prison. Uh, do you join the church while you're in prison? No, I mean I'll be honest with you. So. And this is something, hopefully, I hope to do later in life. The LDS people behind bars are are really not open to anything. And I understand there's a sense of shame for them. Um, so they're not out there welcoming people in. I would go to the Christian services and whatnot. But when I got out and met, we had really two special missionaries there at BYU now. Uh, what's Coulter's last name? McKee. We had Coulter McKee and Sawyer Paul and Chuck. And they were just awesome, among others, because, I mean, I took the missionary discussion so long because the first presidency had to decide if I could come. Yeah, so I had a lot of missionaries that were awesome, but those two definitely stuck out in my mind. And they're here in town at BYU right now. So, you know, hopefully we'll see them after this. So once you got out, Uh uh, you started meeting with the missionaries. Yeah. Um, Did you know, was was it just a matter of, actually getting baptized or was there more of a conversion process after your release? No, I mean, listen, I think, so when I started talking to them, just being completely honest, I was probably more versed in scripture than they were mm-hmm. because I had years and years in prison to read the book of Mormon over right. and over and over. So uh, for me, it was excellent. I mean, I think that those, those guys, I hope I say this correctly, learned as much from me as I did from them. And it was such a powerful experience, you know, and coming from such diverse uh, backgrounds, them being raised in the gospel, me not. So, yeah, no, I mean, uh, it was really important. I will tell you a funny story, though. So we're, we're closing in on baptism, and the first presidency said you can get baptized. And Sawyer says to me, you know, Eric, uh, you can't drink coffee anymore. And I said, I said, well, really? I didn't think that that was part of the baptism. But I gave up coffee that weekend, and I was working a really uh, hard on the line job at Bullfrog. So I gave up coffee. That Monday, they moved me to like a position where I was no longer in manual labor. Mm. So all my fears of losing my caffeine to get through my no day. More, think, right. Yeah, it was like he blessed me immediately. Let me show you what I can do for you. Was that the toughest part? The toughest thing to give up was the coffee? For me, I mean, I, I guess I used it just to fuel myself through the day. Yeah. I wouldn't say I was ever a coffee addict. I, I don't think I was an addict of anything ever. Mm-hmm. But you, you, when you use things that cloud your mind, you lose touch with God, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so you're drinking all the time. How do you have a connection with God? You can't. And that's why alcohol is forbidden. And it makes total sense to me. And I have no will to take any. Coffee uh, was, yeah, the hardest thing to give up for sure. As it should always be. This is the way. So, so, so the first presidency um, was deciding whether I was worthy for baptism. And it took them nine months to, to make that decision. Well, it's, it's also what had to happen during the process is that he had to be off of, he, his sentence had to be finished. Mm. Um, and it wasn't. He was on house arrest. And we were married in 2021. And he was on house arrest during that time. For the next nine months, he he um, took the discussions, um, and we knew that when he was released, his his sentence was finished in 2021 of September. We wrote letters to the first presidency, the mission president did, our so state really president, reset. yes. Yeah. They wrote letters saying that, because usually they want them to be finished with you know, their debt to society. Mm -hmm. And they, um, Derek wrote a letter, I wrote a letter, letters were written, and the first presidency, it took them many months to decide. And we received the news on Christmas Eve of 2021 that he was approved for baptism. They would allow him to be baptized at that time. So for us, that was the greatest Christmas present. Um, And he was baptized in January of 2022. Wow. Yeah. So, just circling back, full timeline, 
First time you're incarcerated is when? 2001. Okay. 2000. I get out 2008. Eight, eight years. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm, I'm committing crimes till 2016 when okay. I go back again. And I get out in 2021. Okay. In and, January. And during that time. We're married in May of 21 in January, Cinco de Mayo. And then uh, I guess I'm baptized that January yes. of 22, right? Yeah, 2022. Yeah. Yeah. And now... Yeah, it's been great. I mean, so you guys can block this out if it doesn't. They, uh, the ward has been so great. They've been like a, a new family, and they gave gave me the the ironic priesthood first, and then the Melchizedek priesthood, and the first presidency. Said, whoa, whoa, slow down. He's, he's still on probation. <laughs> so that that I don't have right now. Um, it looks like I might get off probation a year early for all the stuff that happened with COVID. So that probably will happen in September. So anything to do with the temple until his parole is finished. So the Melchizedek priesthood, mm -hmm. even your limited temple recommends or us being sealed in the temple. It, it has to wait till his parole is finished. Right. Um, and so, you know, hopefully that finishes earlier than we thought. And then, you know, his the flag on his membership record was missed mm -hmm. that there was a restriction. You snuck through a little bit. Yeah, yeah it was missed. <laughs> I'm sure it's a new experience for our state president and all those right. people dealing with a situation like Derek's. Yeah. And so the first presidency wrote a letter and said that, you know, anything to do with the temple, they have to weigh the reputation of the church and the legal um, you know debt that a person has to pay, um, pay to society, and they need that to be completed. And Derek, like he has with everything, took that in pure faith. He knows um, walking in the light is where he wants to be, and everything, any challenge or bump that we've had along this journey, Derek has just taken in pure faith. And he, um, I think one of the things I really appreciate about him is that I think having grown up in a religious household and having the gospel a part of my life, that sometimes you become desensitized to the many blessings that are around you. Um, Derek embraces every aspect of it, and he, see, he sees God's light in everything, whether the sun is shining or he, um, the snow is falling. Derek sees God's love and grace and everything, and it helps me to recognize his blessings, too, and, and to um, be more sensitive to the way that God does bless our life. So, Okay, one last thing. Um, looping back all the way to the beginning, you're committing these crimes, you're, you're Family is living this lifestyle. Uh, did you have a belief in God? And if so, did that influence your, your conscience or the way you perceived yourself? Did you feel like there were going to be repercussions maybe in this life or the next life? Anything like that? Well, I knew there'd be repercussions in this life, but I, I looked at that as sort of that's what we do. Mm -hmm. And this is just part of part of that. Those those are the repercussions you deal with. Um, God, we were uh, atheists. Uh, that was taught to us by our father. I don't want to say overtly, but subtly. Mm -hmm. um, for me personally, though, I always knew what was right and what was wrong. Um, when you're living a criminal lifestyle, like, so the question becomes, what about the person you're committing crimes with? Are you loyal to them? And for me, I always was. What I came to realize in that lifestyle is nobody's loyal to anybody in those secret combinations. They're all waiting to stab somebody else in the back. Um, and that was hard for me to deal with. And I think that that eventually spun me around. And I think what that was was the light of Christ inside of me, always telling me what was actually right and wrong. And I think I knew what was right and wrong. Um, and, you know, now I just have a clearer vision of what I'm supposed to do. I think that this whole journey, what I've learned from this is I that it doesn't matter who you are, where you're at, what you believe, that God's love and mercy is there for everyone. If he can rescue me from my addictions and my difficulties, I, I have that strong feeling. But to go through this journey with Derek and to come from the environment that he has and that the Savior found him and walked with him during his years of incarceration and that he recognized his worth and he found a way to reach Derek. There is not any of us who are beyond the Savior's reach. And I think that's just one of the most valuable lessons that I've learned through this. On, on that note, I want to say this. Um, God is always talking to us. 
And the question is, are we listening? And and God was always talking to me. It's just I wasn't very receptive to what he was trying to tell me. Um, but once I realized the road he wanted me on, it's become really easy to follow. And when she says, I see the, the light and everything, well, I do now. It's very clear to me um, what I need to do, what I should do, the pleasures I take. I mean, listen, as Denise can tell you, one of my favorite pleasures is our dog. I like pampering her, taking care of her. And to me, that means more than all the money in the world. Derek and I actually said that, that there is so much even to my journey of coming back into the gospel. My husband inspires me every single day. And when I watch him come from the depths, the darkness that he came from, he inspires me every single day. And I know that my journey finding the Savior back in my life has inspired me and others around me. And um, but watching Derek and where he's come from, I think his story is powerful. And there is so much to our story. And we have talked at state conferences and churches, you know, and firesides. Um, but I think that's Derek's desire is that his story can inspire others to grab the Savior's hand and, you know, to rise above where they're at and that there is hope in the darkest of circumstances. If people want to learn more about your story, what, you said you wrote a book. So, yeah, I wrote Greed and Fear of the Galanis Crime Family. Um, it ends with scripture, I'll tell you, but uh, the, the book is very dark. Okay. So be prepared for that. Uh, um, fair warning. What many publishers have told me is there's no triumph in this book. This is well, the triumph. triumph is right now. Mm. So And he yeah. wrote a second book, too, okay. which is um, that is the beginning of the catalyst for Derek to find his pathway to God. He is a martial arts champion, mm -hmm. and he wrote a book on martial arts. And that is very much his journey of the beginning of his journey to find God, because it is very spiritually based. Yeah, the final chapter in that I, I titled Mastery, and it's about finding my first spirituality through martial arts. And I think that happens when someone's deprived of the gospel, when they know nothing of spirituality and they're involved in something like martial arts, they'll find it there. God's always trying to reach us no matter what. Um, look, if you look at the movie Star Wars, there's a lot of things within it, the redemption qualities of it, um, Anakin being born without, uh, you know, a, a father, so right. to speak. Yeah, Th they're all really elements of trying to lead people towards the gospel, in my belief. I was reading uh, the parable of the sower this weekend, and I, usually it's like, this is the word of God, this is missionary work, that's, that's the whole message behind it. Um, but I was really impressed by the idea that Christ is always kind of throwing seeds out. Mm -hmm. And there are plenty of opportunities between the times that he's trying to reach us yeah. that we can work to soften our own hearts and, and prepare our ground, so to speak, to yeah. receive that. Even if it's, you know, we've had plenty of missed opportunities in the past, there's always more. Yeah, he, he never, never stops, stops reaching for us. And Derek can even tell times in his youth before he went to prison the first time that God was reaching for him. He just wasn't listening. So. Okay, well, we'll uh, end on that note. Thank you so much for coming. Thank um, you. And if you haven't already, like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time.